So welcome. It's really a pleasure to see everybody here. I'm Kim Brooks. I'm the Dean at the Schulich School of Law. If you haven't had a chance to be at one of these before, this is our mini law series and we hold these about monthly over the course of the year. So if you enjoy tonight, which I'm sure you will, please come back for another one. Um, you're in for a treat tonight. You have Professor Faye Woodman. Um, she was, she's was she been around at the school for a while. When I first started, um, when I first started teaching, Faye was one of the giants in the area that I teach in, which is tax law. And so she was kind of a mythical creature for me. This person had been out there doing all this influential writing. And as a student, I'd done quite a bit of reading of her work. And then, and then when I entered the academy, it was a real pleasure to get a chance to meet her in person. And it's just a joy to get to work with her on this faculty. She's an incredible teacher, well loved by students here. She teaches a whole range of different areas, including property, trusts, and tax, but a little less tax these days. She's a kind of key person in terms of our university's pension work, and she's been a real leader in that capacity, so some of you may have crossed paths with her there. So she is really a very wonderful, well-loved colleague here at the school, and I'm sure you will enjoy her tonight as I do. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Kim is too kind, <laughs> but it feels good. <laughs> As Kim indicated, my uh, areas of teaching and expertise lie in the areas of trust, equity, succession, elder law, and peripherally to income taxation. So that's one of the reasons why I'm giving this lecture tonight on financial help for caregivers and tax and trust and other strategies. But I, I think that I should share with you that there's another personal reason why I'm giving this lecture and I have given a lecture like this to many groups around the city and it's because of my own personal experience of caregivers of people in my family in particular my parents who uh, I looked after for about 10 years and even though it was in some ways very rewarding it also was very challenging uh, I tried to look after my parents from a distance and provide the emotional and physical support that I could, to, could for them. And I came to the conclusion, which some of you may have also come to, that in a resource-scarce system, and given certain society, societal uh, approaches, that in the care of persons with disability, as far as assistance is concerned, uh, the family is the place of first resort, second resort, and third resort. The family is it to a very large extent. And one member of my family said, gee, after this experience, am I ever glad I have a family. But family, families and caregivers face serious, serious challenges. The challenges, the ordinary ones, which are not so ordinary, which may be extraordinary, of physical and emotional and, and care obligations and scheduling, and one that I found that I've spent many years doing of advocacy within the medical system. And in the middle of it, frankly, if I talk about myself, I was not very inclined <laughs> to worry about all the government financial assistance problems and that sort of thing. But in working with some other people in similar situations as my parents, I began to understand that a person with disability and caregiving can impose substantial financial burdens on both the caregivers and the persons with financial uh, um, difficulties. Uh, and, and that there, are, there is a system out there a system of tax and other programs of private law and trusts which can assist with these burdens. But the problem is there is a labyrinth of them. They are complex. They are at the same time spotty, sketchy, and it's just very difficult to find your way through all these different provisions. And so because of my expertise of a sort and because of my personal experience of caregiving, 
My attempt in the lecture tonight will be simply to provide you with a roadmap through some of those provisions, a way of looking at the provisions and trying to figure out what you may like or your loved one may need from this very complex and, as I said, not entirely logical system. And that's what I want to do today. Now, I know that some of you will be attending these sessions because you're just interested in the mini-law series and you may not have a particular interest in financial support of persons with disabilities. But I hope when I teach today that not only will I talk about the technical provisions, but from practice becomes policy and from policy becomes politics. So that it's not like in this law school in any law school, I should think, that we, try, we uh, teach what are called bread and butter courses and at the same time uh, fail to look at the context in which these provisions arise and exist and how they might be made better. So with, within this description today, I will be doing some comments about the good and the bad and the truly ugly in these provisions. And I start here with the important caveat, um, which is that legislation changes. Administrative policies change. Individual circumstances vary and sometimes vary among lay persons in ways that they don't understand have legal implications. So I attempt to provide you with some general ideas I'll provide the roadmap, but you're going to have to do the navigation. You're going to have to do the application. And I might have stepped on a cord. Do you think I did that? Pardon me? No? There it is? Okay, excuse me. So I'm trying to give this roadmap, you navigate the roadmap, and there are other sources, especially if you have general ideas that you can go to. You can seek advice directly from Revenue Canada in person or on the websites. And um, it, an indication of what today was like for me, my original slide, which had this further information, got corrupted somehow during the day. But I had a telephone number, because you can look it up on the web, uh, community volunteers that are organized by Revenue Canada and you have difficulties and you cannot want, do or do not want to go to a paid professional, you can contact this community volunteer group which may assist you with some of your questions. These are a number of the topics we're going to deal with today and one of the things that I really want you to do because we're a small group here, is I want you to interrupt me and ask me questions as I go along. Um, if you have some suggestion or some particular problem that's related to the topic, I'd be most happy to answer questions as we go along. Uh, there will be time for questions at the end too, but sometimes if you have it in your head and you want to answer it, well, want an answer, maybe at the immediate time is the time to put your, head, your hand up. And there's a lot of topics here and these are, these are really, believe it or not, even though they're fairly complex, the most basic of the things that we should look at. The disability tax credit as the gateway to all the other deductions, registered disability savings plan, that much underused plan. RSP rollovers, what do we do with RSPs? It's a huge, huge issue. And then the whole thing of caregiver tax credits, pretty pro forma, but there's a bunch of them that people forget about. Uh, medical expenses, and then the complex interrelationship of attendant care expenses, nursing home expenses, and for your loved one, things like group homes, and things like training schools, things like certain institutions. Um, these things, the expenses of them may all be uh, deductible as medical expenses. And then when we get in a little higher level of planning, we use trusts not only to manage funds for our loved ones who can't manage themselves, but also we use trust funds uh, in certain middle class situations where our loved one is an adult 
has qualified for social assistance. We want to set up and give them a little, little extras of life, but we won't, don't want to do it in a way that would merely substitute our income for social welfare benefits. And there may be a way of doing that in Nova Scotia. Well, what are the challenges for the caregivers here? Well, we want to, uh, we want to recognize the sacrifices of the caregivers, the financial sacrifices, by allowing them to access every deduction and credit and support that they can find. We want to provide uh, the families of, uh, uh, of persons with disability to recognize their economic uh, uh, sacrifices. And if we can, and it's extremely difficult, is to provide some sort of long-term financial stability for persons with disabilities. And the question inevitably comes is, who's going to have control of these finances? And the answer is, well, if your loved one is not able to do that, then you should consider things like trusts, powers of attorney, adult guardianships. These are all legal mechanisms to deal with loved ones who cannot um, take care of their financial affairs. And of course, for personal uh, affairs, you might want to consider, the loved one might want to consider, and you yourself in your life, uh, drawing up a personal care directive for your personal care when you can't make decisions. I'm going to start here with the disability tax credit. Because the disability tax credit is the gateway credit to further benefits under our system. And we often hear a lot about the disability tax credits, how rich it is and how difficult it is, it is at the same time. The disability tax credit is a tax credit, which means it's a deduction from your taxes. It's calculated on amounts, in this case, 7,766. And sometimes the government, I think, in order to kind of feel uh, rich and giving, will say you're getting a deduction of $7,766. Well, really, then they take 15% of it, and that's the real value of what you get. So your tax credit is what you can deduct from tax payable. And then when you brought your tax down to zero, uh, and you have no more tax, and you have dividend tax or disability tax credit left, then you can transfer what you have left to a loved one. So it advant advantages the person with disability by reducing their income to zero if it hasn't already been reduced to zero, and it advantages their, their caregivers because the person with disability can transfer the disability tax credit to their caregivers. The disability tax credit also has a supplement for children uh, of under 18. Now, the disability tax credit can be transferred uh, uh, from your spouse, your children, and in certain circumstances, your parents, your grandparents, your siblings, aunts, uncles, nieces, and nephews. That's what I call the slew of relatives. But the, there is conditions for the transfer of the disability tax per credit. Say your sibling sister uh, is qualified for the disability tax credit, and she wants to transfer it to you. You have to have some connection for the transfer to take place. So the sister has to be dependent on you for one or more of the basic necessities. That is food, clothing, or shelter and that your support of her has to be consistent and regular. That doesn't mean that you have to supply the majority of the support for your sister, no. Indeed, you only have to uh, supply one of those three things on a consistent and regular basis. So you could help, for example, your sister by providing on a regular basis clothes for her. Uh, but it's, it doesn't require by support, support is support, it's not holy support, it is support. And uh, there's been cases, for example, where a person's been able to claim a tax credit when the, per the person with disability was in a hospital and essentially had very few needs, and the few needs that the 
uh, person was providing uh, cigarettes, you know, candies and that sort of thing was considered to be support. So this idea of support is really quite loose and you can qualify it reasonably easy. The other thing you have to do to take a disability tax credit transfer is that you would have had to claim, been able to claim a tax credit in respect of that dependent. We're looking at the tax credits. Or uh, you would have claimed the tax credit but for the fact that you couldn't take, for example, take the equivalent to married because you were married or uh, in certain situations your loved one just made too much income for you to qualify to take the caregiver's tax credit or some of those other tax credits. What's the bottom line here? It's reasonably easy to transfer unused dividend tax credits to other taxpayers within this group of relatives. And that would be a significant assistance to caregivers' expenses. Um, the other thing I want to say is, as I indicated before, that the disability tax credit is a gateway provision for taking advantage of a number of provisions in the income tax uh, system for disabled individuals, including the Registered Disability Savings Plan, the Disability Trust, the Attendant Care Medical Expenses. So we're going to look at these as we go along and try to figure out what, with a, a loved one, what kinds of income tax and other arrangements you can make to reduce your tax situation as a caregiver and their tax situation as a person with disability. Now the first program that I'm going, oh, this is uh, the other thing I forgot to talk about, the cri criteria for the dividend tax credit. Yeah. Uh, I should have asked this at the beginning, but will these be online or will there be some way that we can? They will be online. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, I know it's a lot to take in and I'm kind of sliding over some of the detail. The dividend tax credit, in, uh, there's been a big sort of industry developed about claiming the dividend tax credit. You just can't claim the dividend, uh, I say dividend, disability tax credit. You just can't claim it on your tax form. Uh, you have to do a special separate process to get a disability tax credit. You have to fill in Form T-2201, which is a fairly lengthy form. Part A, the person with disabilities uh, uh, fills it in, and Part B, your doctor fills it in. Now this form, and I filled in many, is quite simple, and it tries to understand through a series of questions whether you fall within the criteria of uh, dis uh, severe and prolonged disability. Filling in the form is not so difficult for you. What is difficult sometimes is getting a medical personnel who is sympathetic to filling in this form, who has some experience filling in this form, and won't frankly just flatly refuse to fill in the form, or I think the worst I've heard is become a lawyer after graduating from medical school and decide they know what all this means and you don't qualify so I'm not going to even let you try to qualify. So that my experience with the thing is that medical personnel are often very difficult to deal with in, in filling out uh, this disability uh, tax credit. On the other hand, some have experience, some are cooperative, and obviously in filling out a form, there are ways of filling it out which support your case better than other ways. And uh, the, the uh, doctors who've had some experience in this uh, tend to do this job somewhat better. But basically, what you have to prove you're a person with disabilities if you want to claim the disability tax credit is that you have to be markedly restricted in one activity of daily living. And that could be speaking, hearing, walking, elimination, feeding, dressing, or performing the mental functions necessary for everyday life. Mental functions necessary for everyday life are things like memory, uh, ad adaptability, uh, setting goals, and that sort of thing. In the elder law area, of course, one of the big things we're looking at is the fact of Alzheimer's on the activities of daily living and particularly the mental functions 
at some point, almost everybody who has Alzheimer's will move from the situation where they don't qualify for the disability tax credit until where they do. And at that point, uh, that's a significantly, uh, a, a significant 1,000 plus credit for them every year to assist them in all the extra costs of that uh, dementia brings to them and the caregivers. Alternatively, it could be significantly restricted in two activities of daily living, so a little less uh, restricted, and all those things above. Um, you could be visually impaired, that's sort of a separate category, um, according to certain criteria set down. Or you could spend 14 hours a week, three times a week, three times a week to a maximum of 14 or at least 14 hours a week for life-sustaining treatment. The one that comes to mind is kidney dialysis, for example. If you qualify under these criteria and you expect the disability to at last 12 more months or as last, last at the 12 more months, then you must complete this form and give it to Revenue Canada and have your med uh, doctor complete it or whoever's appropriately completing it because sometimes it could be a physiotherapist or sometimes it could be a psychologist. Then take the form to Revenue Canada and they'll look at it and they'll usually uh, write back and forth and ask you questions, ask your doctor questions. This process takes anywhere from two to nine months, but now it looks like more nine months and it's only after you get the okay on this form 2202 that you can then actually claim, or your person with disability can claim the disability tax credit and transfer it over to the caregiver if they don't need to use all of it. And in that first year of claiming the disability tax credit, you can't file electronically. Now the big thing is if you're sitting here, and it often is the case with elderly people, that when they started out in that long and sometimes sad and difficult journey with dementia, initially you would not have thought of them as qualifying for the disability tax credit, but then they would go over the line. At some point they're over the line, but life goes on and we don't run out and claim the disability tax credit. But if it's somewhere down the line we think, yes, they should claim it, Yes, they should have claimed it last year and the year before, but we just, I don't know, we're so involved in the decline or trying to help that we didn't think of it. You can go back and refile and claim this disability tax credit for the 10 previous years. And if the disability tax credit is worth uh, $1,800 a year, f filing back for 10 years is going to get you a pot of money, almost $20,000. Yeah. Can you file back if the disabled person is deceased? Pardon me? If the disabled person is deceased, can you file back? Now that's an interesting question. Well, I never. I, I don't know. Have you tried it? No. No. How long ago would the person be deceased? Yeah. It may. I, I would certainly try that. Uh, and I don't know whether well, because it's what's. Yeah, well, the person with disabilities, see, is not refiling, but a legal representative. I don't know. That's an, but I certainly, it's worth checking out. Because very often, I find with elderly people, um, nobody thinks to do it. When it, you, you sit there and you watch them and you say, clearly, this person is eligible for the disability tax credit. It just doesn't come to mind. And particularly sad and particularly difficult when they're clearly, you know, dying. Oh, what a few things about disability tax credit, um, especially for the elderly, you can take it, they can claim a disability tax credit when they may have a very high income. The disability tax credit is not dependent on anyone's income. Um, can the person with a disability work and claim the disability tax credit? The answer is theoretically yes, but practically no. How much income can, um, uh, claim and have, as I said, any amount. If the person with disability qualifies for CPP disability benefits or workers' compensation, 
does that person necessarily qualify for the disabilities tax credit? And the answer is no. All these different programs have different calculations of what is a disability. So you might say, hey, I'm, I'm sad, I'll get the disability tax credit because I can claim workman's compensation or I can claim um, CPP disability benefits. And it, they're different programs with different criteria, and they don't necessarily entitle you to claim the disability tax credits. And who can uh, verify for the disability tax credit to fill in part B? Well, it could be uh, a medical doctor, but depending on the illness. Now, obviously, you're not going to get your optometrist to uh, certify that you have a mobility impairment or something. I mean, but he, occupational therapist, psychologist, medical doctor, audiologist, for he, they can all certify to these things. So assuming that with your loved one you've uh, managed to acquire the designation or eligibility of a disability tax credit, the disability tax credit, as it says, opens the door for other things. And of course, the major centerpiece in recent government policy for tax financial supports for disabled persons is this registered disability savings plan. Now, the registered disability savings plan, for those of you familiar with the RESP, Registered Education, kind of works like that, sort of vaguely. You don't get a deduction contributing to the registered disability savings plans, but when the money's in the plan, it, 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 it grows tax-free, there's no tax, but when it comes out of the plan, uh, generally speaking, at least the contributions are not subject to tax. But there is some fatal flaws, I think, with registered disabil disability savings plans. So the first thing I should say is that the federal government did a survey recently and it, it decided or felt that only 40% of the people who qualified for a registered disability savings plan actually had one. So there's 60% of the people out there that don't have a registered retirement, uh, registered disability savings plan and should have one, should have one because as I explained to, to you in a few minutes, it's free government money. And free government money is just not to be passed up. <laughs> having said that, I like free government money, but you know, having said that, this is really a very flawed provision for disabled people. And it, the reason I say that the person who was behind it, because he had a disabled son, and promoted this along with PLAN, uh, obviously a group for the disabled, was Jim Flanagan, the late Jim Flanagan. And he took particular pride and interest in the development and introduction of this plan in 2008 in Canada. But May I say, because I think every little bit helps, but may I say most respectfully to Jim that this is a plan of the concerns of a fairly small group of privileged families with disabled kids. And it excludes, to a large extent, the elderly, and supports for them. Uh, it uh, excludes uh, people whose life expectancy is short. There are some provisions for that there, but generally speaking, it isn't a life, uh, it, it doesn't help really people with shorter life expectancies. And most importantly, this is a plan that in a way excludes our young people because young people need the supports now. They are poor now. They are looking for means and supports to develop their life, to have a whole and fruitful life, and they need them now. 
So what's this thing? Well, this is a retirement plan for disabled people. It just seems crazy to me of all the things we need. I'm not saying we shouldn't use it. And in my family, if I had the, had, had the particular problem, I certainly would use it. But it just seems a very odd piece of legislation to, to help very uh, fairly wealthy families and, and help these wealthy families not with the present, but with setting up retirement funds for the future. Although it does answer the concern of some families, middle class families, which is what am I going to do with Johnny or Margaret or whatever disabled child typically when I pass on? This is the frightening and perennial problem that parents of disabled children uh, face that as long as they're alive, as uh, long as they're functioning, things go along quite well. But lo and behold, once they leave the scene, what's going to happen? Well, this, to some extent, answers that because they do, it does provide a retirement plan for these kids. Um, what can you do? Well, you can contribute, to, uh, and you can't deduct it, but you contribute up to $200,000 over the lifetime of the particular individual, and uh, you can contribute the $200,000 whenever you want. Uh, essentially, the plan matures at age 59. The expectation is you will start taking amounts out of the plan at age 59. And during that period when the plan is be being built up, um, the government will give free bonds, free bonds, to your registered disabled savings plan over the lifetime of the child up to a maximum of $20,000. Nobody's offered me $20,000 for anything um, ever. <laughs> So, I mean, that's free money. And just for, you don't have to contribute to your registered disabled savings plan. You can just open one up, say, I don't have the money to contribute, but tell the, the government of Canada to put their $1,000 bond in it every year. That's fine. So, too, matching or overmatching grants from the government for what you contribute to the plan up to $70,000 can be made over the lifetime of the person with disabilities. And again, like disability tax credit, if you haven't been doing this and your loved one is eligible for the disability tax credit, then you must, must set up a registered disability savings plan because it is the best vehicle for long-term savings for uh, the disabled. It is it's, it's huge. And you can go 10 years back to pick up the bonds that weren't paid to you or the grants that weren't made um, so that you won't sort of lose them. But the first step in taking advantage of this free money is to open a plan. So you have to go to the, one of the banks and open the plan. Well, there is a few downsides to registered uh, disability uh, savings plan. I'll tell you the upsides. They shelter earnings from, um, earnings from tax, as, and they grow exponentially. Um, and that eventually, whenever amounts are withdrawn from a registered disabled, disability savings plan, lo and behold, they don't affect your social assistance. So you could have a, be a person in Nova Scotia and you could have, you know, with, with earnings and everything, you could have $300,000 in your registered disability savings plan, and it wouldn't affect anything of your social assistance. You still would get your social assistance. And that's something that all, all government across Canada have done. And it also, when you get older, doesn't qualify you for receipt of old age security guaranteed income supplement or CPP disability. So it's kind of, it, it's odd for me, Lincoln, it's odd that th this person who has a registered disability savings plan is so advantaged compared to everyone else, but they are. So the answer to me, to you, is if you're in the position, set up a registered disability savings plan. It is not reasonable not to do that. Well, we look at the bonds that you can get. Um, if your family income is $25,000 or less, more or less, you get $1,000 a year. 
if the family income is between 25 and 43, you get 1,000 prorated, and more than 43, you get no bond. Well, you might think, hey, well, that's not much because our family income is, is higher than these amounts. But family income isn't counted, well, after the child uh, is 18. So once someone's 18, it's their income, and a person with disability often, regrettably, will have very low income, even though their family might have a high income. And the same with grants. If you, the family income is 85,000 or less, but you know, after age 18, the person with disabilities just looked at their income alone. Uh, on the first 500 contributed, 3,000 for every $1, the next 1,000, two for every $2. So in a particular year, the family or the person with disability would contribute 1,500 to the plan and uh, uh, get a, a contributions of 3,500 from the government to make the total contributions to the plan $5,000 in that plan. So that's multiplying, that's a rate of return which I have never seen, ever, <laughs> because you know, one, you get $3 for every $1 you contribute. If the family income is greater than $85,000, uh, then there's much more modest matching by the Government of Canada. What does all this do? Well, all this does is means if we start in 2014, 2015, and we go forward about 15 years or so, you can see that just contributing uh, 1,500 into your registered disability savings plan for the person with disability, and, uh, 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 assuming 5% growth, um, that at the end of that period, um, then you're going to uh, get a total, um, the total value, which is the top line, would be something over $165,000 or thereabouts in 15 years. That's not bad. So the nice thing about that is even though you're poor when you're young, when you're getting older, uh, you're going to be quite comfortable. You're going to be comfortable. Now there's, and since that doesn't affect your GIS, doesn't affect your social welfare like almost everything else does, this is a win-win situation. The problem with registered disability savings plan is a problem of taking money out of the plan. Um, it's very complex. And uh, I was kind of waiting my way through the legislation, and so I talked to my friendly bank manager, and I said, well, do you understand this holdback provision? And he said, no, we don't understand any of that. In Halifax, we send it all to Toronto, which is a typical thing anyway. Um, so it is complicated to understand. Basically, the, the thing you should remember is there's maximums you can draw out in any particular year, even before 60, uh, that are, depend to some extent on your life expectancy, that you, you pull out the, the uh, bonds and grants, they're taxable. And the problem with paying out pulling out bonds and grants before you're 59, before it's matured, is that for every dollar you pay out of the plan, you have to pay $3 back of your bonds and grants. It's punitive. They don't want you to take the money out of the plan when you're young. And if you do, you're going to have to pay back those nice bonds and grants you got. You're supposed to wait until you're 59. But as I said, people are poor now, people are planning their life now, people are seeking and developing the supports for their future life now. So that's a pretty harsh provision. So you take it out before 59, then you're going to have to pay back the bonds and grants. Any questions about that before I turn to your RSPs? Okay, a lot of you may have registered retirement savings plans. We know what they are. A lot of us have little ones at least. And you may or may not know that when you die, an awful thing happens, which is that all the funds in your RRSP or your retirement, registered retirement income fund falls in your income as taxed in your last year of life or what? CRA 
uh, calls your terminal year. So that's a lot of money in one year, falling in one year and taxed at ordinary tax rates. Now you can get around that as again, many of you know, by leaving the money to your spouse and the spouse will put it into her RSP. But an other alternative is if you have a person with this disability who's a child in your house, you can roll the RRS pre, uh, proceeds into your registered uh, disability savings plans tax-free. It won't, these proceeds, if they're put in the registered disability savings plan for your kid, will be not taxed in your terminal year and not be taxed in the kid's hands until they're pulled out of the registered uh, disability savings plans. And so too, if you don't have a registered dis disability savings plan, if you uh, have an infirm or physically infirm or mentally infirm child, you can always roll them over tax-free to the child, for, to an annuity for the child or a, uh, the child's RRSP or RRIF on your desk. So there's ways, that's a big thing that I always visualize when I'm advising people of tax when they get older, that big lump sum of really ta highly taxed RSP. What, is it, what are they gonna do with it to kind of shelter it from tax? One way is to give it to your spouse. Another way, if you don't have a spouse or you wanna divvy it up, is to give it to a child with a disability and you can dissipate and, and prevent the taxation of that big lump sum. Uh, I will just change for a few minutes and talk about caregiver tax credits. Remember the disability tax credit is a credit for the person with disability. Now you may have some benefit from it by transferring it to a caregiver. These credits that I'm gonna look at in a few minutes uh, can be taken in addition to the disability tax credit. They're credits that accrue not initially to the persons with disabilities, but to the caregiver. And of course, the obvious one is a caregiver tax credit. Now, we, uh, you can read these later, um, but basically it's for a whole slew of relatives but the big fly in the ointment to some extent, or the difficulty may be that a lot of people that you're providing a lot of care for don't live with you. In order to claim the caregiver tax credit, he or she, the person with disability, has to have lived with you. And the other thing is that almost all these tax credits, except the disability tax credit, are income tested. So in this situation, uh, if the person with disability has to, in order for you to claim the caregiver tax credit, the person with disability has to have a net income of less than, depending, and we don't have to go into this, 22,060 in the year. That's the net income before in division, uh, division B, before you start taking your credits. So, uh, uh, that uh, once the loved one, once the person with disabilities has income over 15,000, net income over 15,000 a year, not reduced by tax credits, uh, and the caregiver tax credit of the caregiver will be reduced and there'll be no caregiver tax credit once the loved one's income, net income, uh, uh, reaches $22,000. Now, that caregiver tax credit, as you will see later, is goosed up by the family tax credit. This is one I just want to mention very quickly. A lot of people don't um, access this one, and uh, I, in the software I've looked at, they've often got it wrong. Um, but this is basically for relatives who don't live with you. Now, it seems odd to have a caregiver credit for relatives who live with you and relatives who don't live with you. The significant difference between the caregiver tax credit and the infirm dependent deduction besides whether you live or don't live with the person and you don't have to live with a caregiver for the caregiver to take this deduction is that the dependent, the persons with disabilities net income has to be very low, usually not working, might be on social welfare of um, 
It starts being phased out at 6,670, and it's phased out totally at 13,000. But I've known families where they have mentally challenged, ill children who are not on welfare and are over 18 uh, and have very little income. Uh, this might be a provision that you would claim if they don't live with you. And the family caregiver amount is just an amount that uh, goose up some of these other uh, tax credits, and it's a federal government credit. The one other that I want to talk about is equivalent to spouse tax credit. And uh, there's a couple things I want to say is that uh, usually for kids, usually for kids or anyone under 18, but it can be for people over 18 if they're wholly, wholly dependent due to physical or mental infirmity, infirmity or and a lot of people re don't realize that, is if grandma or a parent lives with you and they don't have to be infirm. A lot of people don't remember to take that deduction. Now, in order to take it, of course, you can't live with your spouse, you can't be supported by your spouse, and you cannot support your, your spouse. So that's one that's often forgotten, because when we get older parents, we can't say they're really infirm, but they're living with us, they have low income, uh, you can take the equivalent to spouse tax credit. And looking a little bit at medical expenses, turning to another issue, uh, medical expenses are in two categories. The ones for your immediate nuclear family, yourself, your, your, yourself, your spouse, and your um, uh, under 18 children. If you have other dependents, that big slew that's been on all the cards uh, previously, you can claim their medical expenses, but to calculate their medical expenses, you'll have to use their income and calculate the medical expenses for each of them separately. And it's probably to your advantage uh, because they'll probably have less net income than you will. Uh, some medical expenses to think about, D diapers and disposable briefs, driveway access. That certainly came to the forefront of my mind when I look at my driveway. Um, it's not as accessible for me, much less a disabled person. And um, getting your driveway access more accessible so that people with mobility impairments can get in and out, um, that is a deductible medical expense. Certain kinds of renovation or uh, construction expenses, widening doorways, lowering counters, changing bathrooms, all that stuff is a deductible medical expense. Uh, certain kinds of therapy, certain kinds of uh, therapy are deductible as a medical expense, in this case only if you qualify for the dividend, uh, disability tax credit. Certain kinds of training and some of the things in the autistic world for training, that is deductible in certain circumstances. Tutoring services supplementary to private education are deductible, and I bet you a lot of people don't deduct those. The one that I find odd is that you cannot claim the Lifeline and Healthline services, those little buttons and tags older people put, so if they fall or they're alone, they can call quickly for someone. Those are not deductible expenses. And I just mentioned in passing that there are refundable medical expenses supplement for working individuals with low incomes and high medical costs. I'd like to go into all of those, but we just don't have the time. I also want to turn to another issue, and the issue is attendant care. Um, attendant care is a huge issue I found in looking, at my, looking after my parents. It's expensive. It's hard to get good attendant care often. And um, the tax position with respect to attendant care or the government subsidies are uh, problematic from time to time. If you're going to pay for the attendant care yourself, uh, and the attendant care is only part-time care, um, the recipient can claim part-time attendant care only if they're eligible for a dividend or a disability tax credit. And that means that most part-time care can't be claimed as an expense for tax purposes, and most people get part-time care. If they have to have full-time care, um, they have to be eligible for the dividend tax credit 
although occasionally a, a medical doctor will certify that they need it even though they don't have a, a disability tax credit eligibility. Uh, and there's this complex relationship. You wonder in an area where people are just trying to survive, trying to work and, and deal with their family and support the family the best, best they can, that it gets so complicated. You can claim either all your attendant uh, expenses and no disability tax credit, or up to $10,000 of your attendant care expenses, 20000 in the year of death, and your disability tax credit. So you to, to determine what is a better way of doing it, you simply have to do the math. Nursing home fees. This is a huge one. Uh, when I talk about a nursing home, I should say that I'm not talking about any particular defined institution. Most public nursing homes, which you have, as you know, to pay for anyway, um, most public nursing homes probably are nursing homes that are eligible for the deduction of nursing home fees. Nursing homes are defined in the Income Tax Act as some place where an individual gets full-time care and maintenance. And that's mo mostly public institutions. It is not, generally speaking, assisted living. Although in special cases it may be. Mostly it's just the very seriously ill and disabled people who go into public nursing homes. And of course there's costs for that too. But in certain circumstances, depending on the circumstances, you may qualify if you go into assisted living to deduct your assisted living expenses. But I don't, you know, not often is what I'm saying. And there is, if you deduct your, all your nursing home fees, you cannot deduct either attendant care fees or the disability tax credit. Now, if you want to know what are the nursing fees, this is really quite good. Uh, your nursing fees that you can deduct as medical expenses include food, accommodation, nursing care, administration, maintenance, social program, and activities that qualify as medical expenses. In some nursing homes, they have hairdressers and some little uh, amenities, and those are not considered to be deductible. But most things in a nursing home would be a deductible medical expense. But if you think you're going to live at the Berkeley, uh, that's not going to be deductible unless you're in one of the more ill, uh, they have some ill floors. Uh, you will not be able to deduct your nursing home fees. Now, if you can have a choice. I don't know if I put it. You can have it a, cho a choice, and it's whether you want to deduct your, all your nursing home fees and then some of your attendant, uh, 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 whether you don't want to deduct all your nursing home fees, but you want to uh, deduct attendant care fees. Um, you can deduct attendant care fees up to $10,000 and your disability tax credit. And depending how it works out, it might be better to do one or the other. And that's what's so disheartening, you know, because you really almost have to get an accountant to figure out these ins and outs of the relationship between the nursing homes, the dividend, the disability tax credit, and uh, the attendant fees. Now, nursing homes will give you a breakdown. So you say, maybe it's better that I deduct only $10,000 of attendant fees and the disability uh, tax credit. Maybe that would give me a better uh, result than deducting all my nursing home fees. And you can figure that out by, you go to the nursing home, they're used to doing it. They'll break this down and they'll say, if you're claiming just attendant care fees in the nursing home, these are the percentage of your nursing home fees that are attendant care per, uh, things, um, and um, the rest isn't. So they break down, the, they commonly will break this down for income tax purposes. The final topic I'll have before we, we break off and have some time if you're interested or some questions. Um, is I want to talk about trust for a little bit. Because 
trusts are really where we kind of move out of what we can do for ourselves and really look on getting more professional approaches and professional help in establishing situations to assist our loved ones, first because they may not be able to manage property, but secondly because being often in a middle class family, there is room for giving a disabled child or person in the family some extras, but not everything. And it's that middle class family who's going to want to explore the use of the trust so that when they're gone, when they're not around, that the loved one will be able to enjoy a little few, uh, some few extras in life. There's three kinds of trust that we should talk about here, and they're called disability trust. This is a new kind of trust. Maybe even some of your lawyers probably haven't heard about it. But these are a new kind of trust, disability trust, which were introduced by the federal government uh, just a few months ago. And we're still kind of trying to figure out how to use them, but we've got some ideas. And these are statutory trusts. And statutory trusts are trusts that most provincial welfare schemes across Canada permit parents of children with disability or relatives to set up for a person with disability um, to give them some long-term security and from which the person uh, with disability can draw amounts without disrupting the flow of their social welfare benefits. And I'll say first that sadly, uh, I was working in this area many years ago and I thought I had convinced the authorities, um, at least some subset of authorities, that statutory trusts were a good thing that we should let every disabled individual uh, who's on social assistance, let his or her family or the disabled person themselves set up a trust that would not impinge on their ability to draw on social welfare. And that's what I thought that we we're gonna do and they have never done it. And indeed, the position of the Nova Scotia Self Social Welfare Authorities seems to be somewhat hardening in respect to how they view trust set up for disabled individuals. And the final kind of trust I'm gonna talk about is the Henson Trust and how I think it can be used in Nova Scotia to accomplish some of our goals um, and not to disrupt the ability to have social welfare benefits. So I'm gonna look at each of these trusts and show you how we use them to do what we want to do. Uh, first, before I go into something called the Disability Trust, which is this new trust that uh, um, um, uh, the Finance Minister introduced in the uh, last budget, uh, I should remind you about how social welfare works, not only in Nova Scotia, but in most provinces. And what it does is it says, you can only have so many assets and if you have more than those assets you won't qualify for social welfare and there are some exemptions i know and everything but in nova scotia the assets you can have are a thousand dollars and the other thing is it says if you get any income if you get any income at all it's unearned income you can earn a little income in, in nova scotia but if you get unearned income gifts or uh, amounts like that, even theoretically, I push them, theoretically, even if your family gave, them good, gave you gifts, then your social welfare benefits are going to be reduced. So what the Disability Trust attempts to do and what um, the Registered Disability Savings Plan attempts to do and what the Henson Trust, Trust to do is to preserve social welfare benefits, knowing that in order to replace social welfare benefits would require a chunk of money that most middle class families don't have. So in the last budget, um, the government of Canada brought in something called the Disability Trust because um, 
because it did some, something terrible to, uh, terrible to the law of trust. It changed the rate of taxation on trust set up on a person's death under a will. And it made that rate of taxation very high. And people working with people with dis disabilities said, hey, that's not fair. One of the ways we provide for a loved one on death is to use these called testamentary trusts. So they made the d disability trust different. First of all, to get the advantage of a disability trust, the person with disabilities must qualify for the disability tax credit. But once it becomes a disability tax credit, the accumulating income in the trust, that's a, that just stays in the trust, it's not paid out to the beneficiary, that's taxed at very low rates that you no longer can access anymore. So that's a really big benefit. Um, uh, payments can be made only to beneficiaries with disabilities out of this disability trust. Um, and there can be other non-disability benefits, but they should not receive amounts from the trust while there are benefits, beneficiaries with disabilities. The whole point of this is that you can put money in a trust for your loved one called a disability tax trust and get preferential rates while the income is accumulating in the disability uh, trust. It is hoped that all the provincial social welfare systems will amend their provisions so that amounts paid out of the disability trust will not reduce the social welfare assistance. That has not been completed as yet, but that's the hope. It's kind of, um, it's kind of like a hence, uh, it's kind of like a registered disability savings plan, but it's not so complicated. It doesn't have the bonds. It's a discretionary trust. Uh, it is uh, uh, a much more flexible thing than the registered disability savings plan, which is for retirement. So that's one thought. Nobody really knows yet quite how they're being used because the legislation isn't complete. I said there's no statutory trust in Nova Scotia, but if your loved one lives in another place, like Ontario, you're allowed to set up a $100,000 trust for your loved one and it won't affect their social assistance. In Nova Scotia, it appears at this point, the only way we can set up a trust for our loved ones is by the use of something called a Henson Trust. Now, a Henson Trust is a particular kind of trust and the terms of the trust say, say I had a disabled daughter. All the income of this trust is to be accumulated and the trustees in their sole discretion shall pay out the income to my disabled daughter, Judith. Now, by the terms of the trust, a couple things are accomplished. The big problem with setting a trust with money if it's not a statutory trust is that um, the trust being worth a lot of money, having a lot of funds in it, will, will take away your eligibility to claim social assistance because you'll have this big chunk of money as an asset and you won't claim for social assistance. So that's why we make a Hanson Trust a discretionary trust. And a discretionary trust, and I can make one up on a piece of paper, just says, I name a beneficiary. My beneficiary is Joe Blocks, good friend of mine. He's going to be the trustee of this trust. And he can pay out amounts of that trust to my daughter Judith in his sole discretion. So she may not get a cent from that trust, and she has no way of forcing that trustee to pay an amount out because I've said in the trust indenture, in his sole discretion. Therefore, since she has a, a hope, a speculation of getting out of a discretionary trust, she doesn't um, uh, fail the asset test because her, a discretionary trust as an asset is worth nothing. Okay? So the, now, when amounts come out of a discretionary trust, they are unearned income and could reduce your social assistance on the basis of unearned income. 
in the month you receive the income out of the discretionary trust. But there's ways of getting around that. In Nova Scotia, they have told me, and I truly believe, and they, haven't, they do change their administrative uh, policies from time to time, that if the money comes out of the uh, trust for sort of informally improved purposes, maybe they won't take that money away from the person with disability by essentially immediately reducing their social welfare. So if it goes out for medical supports and things that they think that the child needs or the person needs, then they will reduce in Nova Scotia uh, social assistance. And other provinces have very explicit rules about what coming out of a Henson Trust will reduce social assistance and will not reduce social assistance. But the nice thing about it is since it's not an asset, you could have a big glursh of uh, income come out of a Henson Trust for one month and lose your social assistance for one month. But if it was used for approved purposes, then the next month your social assistance might be restored in Nova Scotia. Now I talked to the authorities and uh, I know people are using Henson Trusts uh, and they make a lot of sense in law. But they have a provision in the Nova Scotia regulations that says all amounts in a trust will reduce your social assistance as long as it's feasible for the person with disability to get hold of that money. And I said to the powers that be, well, a discretionary trust, a beneficiary has no rights against a trustee. It's not feasible and therefore uh, Henson Trust shouldn't reduce your social assistance at least until its money's paid out of, uh, from it. And I got sort of silent, so uh, they're, they're not too pleased. And I've had arguments with parents from time to time. I don't want to set up a scheme where sooner or later some person's going to change the legislation, but that's all we've got now. That's all we have in Nova Scotia. Nova Scotia doesn't have the provisions of BC. Nova Scotia doesn't have the provisions of Ontario that, uh, that recognize very specifically the particular problems of persons with disabilities and the particular financial challenges. Well, I went on not too long, till 10 after 8, and uh, there's lots to talk in this area. I don't know if there's any questions that people have or any um, particular uh, situations they could, yeah. Um, for, the, for the just disability tax credit, that's the first one that you started with, right? Um, it said visual impairment. Do you know anything about that? My father's in his 80s and he's not blind, but he's definitely visually impaired. Yeah, it's, there's actual, you'll know quickly, it's, it's in the provisions of the regulations, or you can call up Revenue Canada. It's very precise, they have vision of, you know. Yeah, that's right, it's just very straightforward. So, but the, you're describing something that's very obvious, that people would lose their vision as they get older and not think to apply for the disability tax credit, I'm sure. Like a lot of older people who retire for a year, your father would appreciate an extra thousand eight hundred dollars a year. So yeah. With the medical, like, like we've been we've been buying things for him that aren't necessarily medical, but are ways to improve his quality of life. Yeah. As a visually impaired person, so would they be? Do you know if they would? Be yes. Yeah, so well, it depends what they are. There's a huge long list. It's found on the web of things that are eligible for medical expenses, they can't just be good or necessary, they have to be on this list. Um, and so you'd have to look down the list and it, you'd be surprised, it's a very long list. Yeah. Yes? Um, under the medical, medical expenses, you talked about therapy as being something you can claim. Um, would that be like provided by the government or if you were to hire a private therapist? If you're a hire a private person. The cost of hiring that private person, especially in the autistic world, where it's very expensive, um, can be a medical expense. Yes. Mm. It's something to think about if, for whatever reason. Yeah. Any other questions? So similar to the question on uh, visual, is there an objective criteria for dementia? Uh, that's a really, really difficult one. Because, um, you know, I work 
frankly, with a, a lot of elderly people. And the other people I work with are a lot of young uh, people with mental, severe major mental illness. The disability tax, uh, the disability um, tax credit is very problematic in the area of mental uh, ability. Uh, with my young people, it's hugely problematic because it says that you have to have a severe and prolonged disability, which not only means for 12 months or going to be 12 months, but 90% of the time. And if you have dealt with people with bipolar or indeed the ups and downs of schizophrenia or some kinds of addiction, they are very, very ill persons. But at some time, but in many cases, you can't say 90% of the time they're ill because it's the nature of mental illness. It's the instability of mental illness. And that some people have been rejected because you're, you're bipolar, you're manic, and then you're terribly, but somewhere in the middle, <laughs> you're okay, and therefore you're not 90%. So it's, it's really, so that in answer to your question, having dealt with these individuals and being frustrated by the system, I find that elderly people, although they, they do have good days and bad days, um, there is a line they pass with dementia where the memory is very poor. And I don't mean poor in the sense of, uh, you know, they can't remember who you are, but I mean poor and doing everyday things and taking change, going up to the, do their banking, do grocery shopping. So that sort of thing is, you know, and, and where they can't be, uh, they can't remember to turn off the fire, you know, things like that. They can't plan. Um, they can't set goals. They can't really adapt. They become very rigid. This is all part of, and it's, it's just where on that line you think the person, because it's, not all people obviously with Alzheimer's are eligible for the disability tax credit. Um, but I, I think a lot of people do miss the disability tax credit because of the mom or dad or themselves, I don't know, go along that line at some point they've passed it. And see, it's in that respect that it's nice to have a contact with a sympathetic family doctor. My biggest frustration is doctors either think they know when they should give a disability tax and they don't know the law. It's a legal question, not a medical question. They haven't got experience. They answer the, the questions in a way that disentitles. I'm not saying anyone should lie or anything, but there are ways of answering questions and they answer the questions a long way. So it's always worthwhile looking around for a doctor or talking to your doctor about, well, what do you think about this? What's your experience? Have you ever filled in one of these forms? The geriatric assessment unit does you know, tests for them, so you would think that part of what they do, this would sort of be a... Mm, yeah, I mean, uh, that's true, but that's for medical. Well, it it's but for it's capacity. Yeah. yeah, it is, but this is... Uh, you know, when they do these capacity tests, what it is under the uh, adult uh, guardianship, the criteria, can you manage your business affairs? Well, I know quite normal people who can't manage their business affairs. That's a very high criteria. And then in the Personal Directives Act, it says, uh, do, do you have the knowledge and the ability to understand the result of taking a certain decision or the result of not taking a certain decision? that way um, you know a lot of thing a lot of these tests are for particular things ones for capacity when you when you uh, the test for making your will is a very high test a lot of people don't know that the test for making your will is much higher than getting married which i always thought was a, a hilarious so in getting your will and drawing a will you must know the nature of a will you must know Generally, the nature and extent of your property. You must know the natural objects of your boundary, a bounty, and you mustn't be under any delusions that would distort your testamentary deliberations. Um, with the disability tax uh, credit, it, it's a different kind of world. What they're asking is, can you carry on the activities of daily living? That's kind of different than that other test I gave you, isn't it? Yeah. So it's because these other tests fail or pass, 
uh, you know, some of these mini mental tests, you know, back, uh, reciting back seven and doing that stuff. I'm not sure how, how relevant. Um, the whole process has been medicalized, and I think we as individuals have to push back a little bit and apply a little common sense. So activities of daily living is a fairly low test, yeah, mentally. I mean, you have to do simple things is the description. By the way, if anyone wants to know a little bit about um, disability or further disability supports, Revenue Canada, on the Revenue Canada website, if you just type in disability, uh, has great little videos about particular issues. So that now, hopefully, I've drawn a bit of a road map. You can start looking at particular issues that might be of interest to you. I just hate it when people don't take deductions and get supports they are entitled to, given, in my experience, how limited the resources are generally. Any other questions? Well, uh, if I'm I'm Faye.Woodman at Dow.ca if anyone has any questions or references or whatever they want. And uh, this will be on the web. And so I've enjoyed having you tonight. And uh, have a safe journey home. Thank you.